After the tank's dramatic introduction on the Western Front of World War I, the world's great powers began contemplating just how armored warfare would look in the future. As those early, lumbering vehicles trundled their way across enemy trenches, heavy tanks were envisioned as being used in the breakthrough role. They would operate with infantry in assaulting enemy defensive positions, using their thick armor for protection while their immense firepower would destroy bunkers and other armored vehicles. Heavy tanks had the potential to wreak havoc on the battlefield and come the dawn of World War II, German examples such as the Tiger and the Panther have forged themselves a near legendary status in the annals of armored warfare. Facing significantly superior enemy numbers as the war dragged on, the German army put more and more faith in heavy tanks, hoping their effectiveness would, at the very least, even out the balance. And in numerous battles, this seemed to be the case. On the other side, the Soviet Union was probably the most enthusiastic of the Allies when it came to heavy tanks, not just from a tactical standpoint, but from a psychological perspective. In today's episode, we're going to look at the tanks that bore the name of the Soviet leader Joseph Stalin, known to his followers as the Man of Steel. This is the story of the Stalin heavy tanks and how they helped the Soviets blunt German armored superiority and push the fascists back to final defeat. Welcome to Wars of the World. The KV tanks. Soviet experience fighting entrenched and determined Finnish troops in the Winter War of 1940-1941 resulted in a crash program instigated to develop the KV-2 heavy assault tank from the KV-1. This was a desperate measure by any stretch of the imagination. The KV-1 weighed in about 45 tons and was armed with a 76.2mm main gun. The KV-2 dispensed with the KV-1's turret, instead replacing it with a large tower, within which was housed a 152mm howitzer, intended primarily for destroying fortified positions, but could also be used in an anti-tank role. This configuration added another 7 tons onto the vehicle, bringing it up to around 52. Purely for reference, the US M4 Sherman was almost 20 tons lighter than the KV-2. The KV-1 and 2 were the brainchild of one Clement Voroshilov, a senior Soviet military leader and Communist Party member who had managed to survive the paranoid Stalin's great purges by helping the dictator remove anyone who had fallen out of favor. Toward the end of the fighting, the heavy tanks that bore his initials began field tests against the Finns, who found they had almost nothing that could stop these armored behemoths. Famously, Finnish troops often only fired two to three shots at them before retreating if they didn't get a lucky hit, so as not to waste ammunition. The Soviets were pleased with their new tanks. However, despite this success, Vorishilov was now himself falling out of Stalin's graces, with him being blamed for much of the Red Army's initial failings in the conflict. Also, the tanks were demonstrating their shortcomings. The KV-2, for example, with its tower-like turrets, was very top-heavy and unstable on rough ground. While the earlier KV-1 drew criticism due to the fact that despite its cost, the 76.2mm gun could be mounted on the newer, cheaper T-34 medium tank, and there seemed little justification in investing in it further. Thus began a project to upgun the KV-1, something that would grow in urgency when the German Tigers would make their spectacular debut on the Eastern Front. In order to allow time to develop a tank to meet the new requirements, a stopgap measure saw the KV-1 modified to the KV-85 standard, which saw the hull widened to accommodate a larger turret featuring greater armor protection and fitted with an 85mm main gun. 145 of these tanks were manufactured, and further efforts were made to increase the firepower as, again, the cheaper T-34 was now also equipped with an 85mm gun. 
Further development saw the fitting of both short and long-barreled guns, but the KV line was about to come to an end. Even at this early juncture in the war, it was quickly being realized that differing types of tanks for specific roles was placing significant demands on both the Soviet industry and the Red Army's supply chain. Thus, thoughts began turning towards developing a universal tank that could meet many of the requirements of both the medium and heavy tanks in the same hull, essentially forming the basis of today's main battle tank concept. Designed in late 1941 by the SKB Design Bureau, the KV-13 was an attempt to produce a tank that would replace both the T-34 and KV-1 on the production lines, and was developed off the KV-1 chassis. The two prototypes received a wealth of mechanical problems that would have to be overcome before it was made a viable weapon, and so testing was discontinued. However, it was then decided to incorporate the three-man turret of the stopgap KV-85 with the KV-13's hull. This was a much more satisfactory vehicle than either of its donors, and was ordered into limited production, but with Varishalov having fallen further out of favor with Stalin for his handling of the siege of Leningrad, a new designation was required, and in the political wrangling of Soviet Russia, the best way to get ahead was to appeal to Stalin's vanity. Thus, the tank was named the Joseph Stalin, or IS-1, based on the anglicized spelling of his name. The 46-ton IS-1 enjoyed greater protection than its KV-2 predecessor, thanks to not only heavier armor, but also more advanced application of the armor, although at a cost of reduced mobility. It had a top speed of 23 miles per hour, 10 miles per hour less than the famed T-34, with which it would share much of the fighting to come. However, the IS-1 inherited an old, fatal flaw from its predecessors, in that it still sported the same armament as the T-34, and so, almost immediately, work was instigated to upgun the Stalin tank. Fortunately, the KV-85 turret was roomy enough to incorporate larger caliber weapons, and two were selected to be trialed in prototypes. One was the 100mm BS-3 gun, already in use on the Su-100 tank destroyer, and which had excellent armor penetration qualities, while the other was the newly developed 122mm A-19 gun. In the end, the A-19 won out on the grounds that it was the best all-round weapon for both anti-tank and breakthrough roles, the latter of which was seen as a much higher priority for the new tank, rather than solely dueling with the heavy German armor. Initial production of the IS-1 began in late 1943, with 67 having been built by the end of the year. However, the decision to switch to the more powerful IS-2 variant meant that these vehicles were sent back to the factory to be rebuilt before they could make their presence known on the front lines. Comrade Stalin was so impressed with the weapon that bore his name, he proclaimed that with this tank, the Soviets would win the war. Production IS-2s were being churned out of the factory by the end of 1943, and in February 1944, the first heavy tank regiment was formed on the type. Given the high expectations of the tank, it was initially issued to elite guards units and a typical regiment comprised of four companies of five tanks. The IS-2 entered the fray in April of 1944, when the newly formed 11th separate guards unit fought German Tiger tanks of the 503rd Heavy Panzer Battalion near Tarnopol, Ukraine. During the fight, the Germans managed to destroy one IS-2 before they were forced back by the Soviets. This fight made the Germans aware of the tank's existence, but they wouldn't appreciate the threat it presented until almost a month later, when the Soviets launched an offensive towards the Romanian town of Turgu from Oz. Still largely unaware of their new foe, the previously confident German Tiger crews were amazed to find that as they engaged the Soviet heavy tanks with their lethal 88mm guns at ranges of 3 kilometers, their shells simply bounced off the IS-2's heavy armor. A German counterattack saw their tanks have to get in extremely close in order for their shells to have the energy in order to be effective, knocking out three IS-2s. While German guns like the 88 could, under the right circumstances and from the right position, penetrate the armor of the IS-2, 
The Germans had nothing in the same class as the IS-2's own 122mm gun. While a potent anti-tank weapon, it was in the direct fire support role, hurling high explosive shells onto enemy positions where it really shone. The reason was simple. The Germans' own Tiger Ones and Panthers could fire 9kg and 4kg explosive shells respectively, while the IS-2 was sending back 25kg shells. And while the IS-2 did carry dedicated high-explosive anti-tank shells for fighting other vehicles, even this blunt instrument was enough to deal a death blow to some of the older Panzers, still being fielded by the German army. This awesome firepower came with a serious drawback, however namely an appallingly low rate of fire. The shells and the propellant had to be loaded into the gun separately and were heavy and difficult to manage. Even the strongest and most skilled loaders took between 20 to 30 seconds to complete the task, an eternity when enemy armor is bearing down on your position. However, the IS-2 crews took solace in the fact that once loaded, whatever they were aiming at was usually destroyed, and that their frontal armor was tough enough to withstand a great deal of punishment. Another problem that reared its head for the IS-2 crews was that often, stocks of 122mm shells would dry up, unlike the 85mm gun-armed T-34s, for which millions of shells were available. The growing number of IS-2s appearing in the battlefield was increasingly a source of concern for the famed German general Heinz Guderian, himself one of the great military planners for conducting armored warfare. Summing up battling the new Soviet heavy tank, he wrote, quote, I believe that for every Stalin, we must account for an entire platoon of Tigers. This was a dramatic reversal when one considers how effective Tigers were against larger numbers of medium tanks up to that point, and would continue to be until the end of the war. Guderian's sentiments would be expanded upon in a German manual entitled Notes to Panzer Troops, which read, Stalin tanks can be brewed up, although penetration is by no means easy against the frontal armor at long ranges. Stalin tanks should, wherever possible, be engaged in flanks or by the rear and destroyed by concentrated fire. Stalin tanks should not be engaged under any circumstances by Tigers in less than troop strength. To use single Tigers is to invite their destruction. However, while the Germans were impressed by the firepower and protection afforded by the IS-2, they were less so with the new Soviet tanks' mobility on the battlefield that made them hulking targets to be pummeled with shells from tanks or artillery once it had been located. The painfully slow rate of fire also exacerbated the problem for the crews, meaning accuracy when firing and delivering that killer blow was of high priority. But again, German tank aces noted how in the early days, the IS-2 regiments seemed to lack the skills necessary to make the most of their new weapon. This would change with experience, but numerous IS-2s were lost in the meantime due to this inability to fully exploit its potential and address its weaknesses. The apparent taming of their once lethal Tiger fueled the development in Germany of an even more powerful successor. The Tiger II, or King Tiger as it was known to the Allies, even outweighed the hefty IS-2, coming in at around 70 tons, sporting 185 millimeters of sloped armor at the front, which increased its effectiveness and was armed with an improved version of the 88 millimeter gun of its predecessor. Like its forebear, the Tiger II savaged hordes of tanks of all classifications on all fronts where it was deployed. However, it shared a weakness with its Soviet counterparts in that the protection and firepower it was afforded came at the cost of mobility. And on the rapidly changing Eastern Front especially, numerous examples were abandoned as they simply couldn't keep up with the retreating German forces. However, the Soviets were not sitting idle with their IS-2 either, and even as it was entering the fight, a more advanced weapon was already under development. The IS-3 incorporated a number of improved features, the most notable being its semi-hemispherical turret and its pike-nosed forward hull, both of which improved armor protection without adding more weight. However, the development of this third iteration was delayed, meaning the IS-2 would, as Stalin had prophesied, be the one to help end the war. Now with the introduction of the new Tiger II, the stage was set for a matchup between the two Eastern Front heavyweights to determine the better tank. That battle began in August of 1944 in Poland, 
along the Sandomage bridgehead when the German 501st Heavy Panzer Battalion counterattacked Soviet forces. On August 13th, 11 IS-2s from the 71st Independent Heavy Tank Regiment were attacked by 14 Tiger IIs that had closed to within 600 meters, at which point the 88mm German guns were able to threaten the IS-2's thick armor. Accounts of the engagement put the final tally at 4 Tiger IIs destroyed and 7 damaged, compared with 3 IS-2s destroyed and the same number damaged. Too close to truly call. However, one outcome of the battle is uncontested, namely that the losses were far more painful for the Germans than for the Soviets. For while the Red Army would eventually field 3,854 IS-2s, the Germans would only ever receive 489 Tiger IIs. With the arrival of 1945, Nazi Germany was now in its death throes, and with every engagement, the Soviets could call upon hundreds of 85mm gun-armed T-34s supported by the hard-hitting IS-2s. Any combat between tanks firmly favoured the Soviet side, who also enjoyed heavy air cover. Meanwhile, the IS-2's fire support role grew in importance, as the Red Army cleared away entrenched German defenders from towns and cities, until by mid-April, they were knocking on Hitler's front door as they approached Berlin. IS-2s were heavily involved in the bitter and brutal fighting for the German capital, often operating in groups of four with supporting infantry, their 122mm high explosive shells suppressing any German forces embedded in the rubble of the Third Reich's capital. In those final, desperate days, boys as young as 12 were often given loose-fitting German uniforms taken from dead soldiers and thrust into the defense of the city. One can only imagine the fear they experienced upon seeing these armored Goliaths advancing on their position, witnessing them demolish buildings in a single shot. The Germans put up a fierce, final resistance in the defense of their capital, but it was not enough to save them. In the final hours of the war, IS-2 tanks blasted the Reichstag building before Soviet soldiers raised their flag triumphantly on May 2nd, 1945, bringing an end to the war in Europe. The IS-3 had narrowly missed out on the fighting in World War II, but that didn't stop the Soviets from showing the tank off during the victory parade in Berlin on August 7th, 1945. The Western Allies were initially awed by the Soviet heavies, but as relations soured between Moscow and Washington in the immediate post-war years, Western armies began to view the IS-2 and IS-3 as a very real threat. British armoured training manuals even plagiarised German wartime ones regarding the Stalin tanks, while newer, heavier tanks were developed specifically to counter them, such as the American M103 and the British Challenger, both of which sported a 120mm gun. Both the IS-2 and 3 were upgraded to keep them relevant and remain in service well into the 1960s. China attempted to copy the IS-2, although this project came to nothing while Egypt acquired a number of IS-3s for use in the various Middle Eastern wars with Israel. Despite an on-paper advantage when compared to many of Israel's medium tanks, the IS-3s fared badly against the skilled Israeli tank crews. The Soviet-made heavy tank was also poorly suited to desert operations. Soviet engineers did work on designing successors to the IS series, and several rather promising designs and prototypes received the IS designation. The IS-4 was an improved IS-2 with greater armor, but only had a limited production run due to its even worse mobility, the production of the IS-3 having already started, and the end of the war negating further investment. Several prototypes and paper tanks came afterwards, but it wasn't until the IS-10 that a production vehicle was produced, sort of. You see, by the time the IS-10 was ready to be introduced into service in 1953, Stalin had by now passed away much to the relief of many in the Soviet Union. Freed of the tyrant who had oppressed them for almost a quarter of a century, the new regime wanted to distance themselves from his era as much as possible. And so, just like when Varishalov fell out of favor with Stalin and his heavy tanks lost his name, now Stalin had his name stripped from the heavy tanks also, the IS-10 becoming known simply as the T-10. And there you have the story of the Stalin tanks.
please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions. And remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.